Dear friends, we will begin our session in this afternoon. Um, and this afternoon is uh, divided in two parts. The first part will be a conference of Brother uh, Kirill Hovarun, and, and the second part, some sort of a final discussion. Dear friends, we will begin our session in this afternoon. Okay, that's very nice. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, I'm very happy that Father Kirill Hoberun made it to join us because he accepted the invitation. However, he got another invitation for at least for a Thursday to give a keynote lecture in Lund uh, on on Ukraine. And but you was, have been so ascetic to immediately after then the other day to go to Copenhagen and to uh, join us to the travel to Kalamata. Uh, Father Kirill Hoberun is uh, based in Ukraine, born in Kiev probably, and uh, he is uh, teaching actually in uh, Rome at the Gregor Gregorian University and also in Sweden, if I'm of although he was also in Yale and in California and many other places. He made his uh, doctorate with Father uh, Andrew Laus uh, on the monotelite uh, disputation, and which was published in Brill, I think, with Brill in the in the first decade of the 2000. Yes, uh, Father Kirill, it's your turn now. We are happy that you are again with us after several times already, for instance, in, in the Saloniki or in Estagom and maybe also in other places. It's your turn. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. First of all, I'd like to apologize for being late. Uh, I feel myself like arriving in the 11th hour, uh, but I always feel myself ascetical when it comes to Greece. So whenever there is a chance to come to Greece. I, I can be whatever you ask me to be just to be here. It's such a, such a beautiful opportunity, especially this was really a, um, an amazing discovery of Kalamata for me personally, and I, I hope for every one of us. Uh, so as you can see, I have slightly modified my uh, title. Uh, I made it a bit uh, spiced up uh, and kind of more maybe catchy. Um, hopefully not kitschy, uh, and I'm, I'll explain why I, I put this title. In my paper, I'm going to argue that the evolution of the synodal ethos and uh, institutions, instruments of the church had two main driving forces, ecclesial slash theological crisis and logistics. In contrast to our days, uh, when councils have become routinized and gather is it all right? Am, am I heard well? That's only the no, it's all right. I will I will start it in due time. Um, so, uh, in contrast to our days when councils have become routinized and gather when, in most cases, there is no urgent need for them. Like, for example, the Council of Crete, uh, which, in contrast to the old councils, um, did not have a pressing agenda. I would say. Um, the early Christian councils happened only when such urgent needs happened. I would call such councils ad hoc. The earliest ad hoc council that we are aware of was convened in Jerusalem sometime in the middle of the first Christian century. We know that it was urged by the most church dividing issue of the time, whether to try to contain or to let the Jesus movement to spill out to the non-Jewish milieu. Later on, the chain of events caused uh, by the persecutions, including the rising wave of lapsi uh, and the need to reaccommodate them in the church, as well as discipline related schisms, which were related to the lapsi, of course, urged local churches to hold another series of ad hoc councils, mostly in the second and third Christian centuries. All these councils were local. They were initiated and executed by the church without any help from outside. The situation changed in the early fourth century 
One year after promulgating the Edict of Milan in 314, Constantine, at the time the ruler of only the western part of the Roman Empire, convened a council in Arles, what is now France. His goal was to help the church to deal with the Donatist schism. This gathering became a game changer, I believe. It is the first imperial synod sponsored or co-sponsored by the state. It was still ad hoc uh, because it addressed a very particular issue in the Latin speaking North Africa, but its weight was now different from the early ad hoc councils. Most of the later councils, including the ones which we now in the East call uh, ecumenical would become imperial as well. Meaning that they were sometimes initiated always paid for and often, and often present, uh, presided by the state. Soon <clears throat> the church faced a crisis that would last in the East for almost the entire century and in the West a couple of centuries longer. It is conveniently uh, called Aryan, but this is more a, pro a propagandist trope than the historical reality. It started in Alexandria and indeed was initially connected with the name of the local presbyter Arius. Soon it would become much bigger than Alexandria or Arius and engulfed the entire uh, imperial church. It spread across the empire and spilled beyond its boundaries. The main instrument to tackle this series of crises became the Institute of Councils. Both the church and the state perceived this institute as the most appropriate one to deal with the issue of Arianism. As a result, the church literally exploded with councils. They were convened in every corner of the empire and outside it, on all levels of imperial administration, municipal, provincial, diocesan, prefectural, and finally pan-imperial. Antagonizing church parties called councils against each other, causing what I would call synodomachia. Well, it is in the title of my presentation, synodomachia. Indeed, the entire fourth century could be called the century of synodomachia. However, the spread of the councils in the East and the West was not even. There were more councils in the East, as this can be seen in the following charts that I'm going to demonstrate now. Uh, the councils that took place in what is now believed to be Christian East, even though at that time it was a bit different, are marked in this uh, chart as dark blue. The councils in the modern Christian West are in dark red. So the first one is, you can see uh, only really uh, one council happened in Rome. It was in the period under uh, Constantine, the period of Constantine. Then uh, the councils became more uh, spread to the West. And you can see um, the next stage, the councils that happened under Constantius II, under the successor of Constantine. Uh, you can see that there are more councils happening in the, uh, well, what we now perceive as the West, but still there were no, uh, not as many in the West as they were in the East. So the East was really the main playground for the councils in the fourth century. And then we can see uh, the councils that happened after Constantius. So all those councils are related to the, uh, well, what you now call Aryan controversy, but I would, I think it, it is more correct to call it Nicene or post-Nicene controversy. Uh, still, you see uh, there are more councils happening in the East than in the West. Hence is my first hypothesis. The roots of the idea that the Christian East is more conciliar, of course, this idea can be completely wrong. It's a myth. As, and we, we understand now that it's uh, greatly mythical because like the West had during the last two centuries had more ecumenical councils than the East tried to have. And uh, uh, well, our epic failure with the, with the great council in Crete demonstrates that probably this idea is kind of mythical, but still it is a kind of uh, an actual myth that still uh, circulates and uh, um, captivates the imagina imagination of many. And uh, whatever it is, the roots of this idea that the Christian East is more conciliar than the Christian West go back to the fourth century, the century of Synodomachia, because at that time the Aryan crisis was more tense in the East, more councils tackling this crisis happened there, 
This experience of crisis management, usually not a very pleasant one, was eventually transformed to stronger institutes and identities of synodality, which uh, really uh, happened in the East. Of course, this was not the only fact, uh, factor that contributed to the enhanced synodality in the East, but certainly one, it was one of the most important ones. My second hypothesis is that along with fierce theological controversies, logistics played a pivotal role in the formation of synodal institutions. In the period when the church started convening its councils, traveling was a luxury. On the one hand, Roman roads were more affordable and accessible for folks who did not have imperial business uh, than, for example, the roads in the Persian Empire, which had been the first one that introduced a network of trans-imperial highways. I, I just uh, finished reading a book about the Persian Empire, the Achaemenid period, and it was really very clearly stated there that the first pan-imperial network was established by the Achaemenids, and then the kind of Romans inherited it somehow. But the Romans also upgraded this network significantly and made it really accessible to anyone. Uh, in theory, because on the other hand, still only a few could afford using the road system of the Roman Empire. Christian bishops were not yet rich enough at the time to be able to travel at their convenience. Um, and this is a picture that shows, I took this picture in the ancient Babylon, uh, Biblos in what is now Lebanon. This is uh, an originally a Persian road, then was turned into, turned into the Macedonian road, and then eventually it became a Roman road. So it's all the same road, but it went through different phases. And you can see uh, also one can observe really the evolution of what is the idea of the road and its play in, the, in its role in the life of the people and societies. The availability of roads seemed to concern the church not much less than the issues it tried to solve. I would be uh, that materialistic in, in this my hypothesis. In my opinion, that was one of the reasons why the church picked up, a, picked up a word to describe the gatherings of its leaders that had the word iodos road, uh, road at its root. So synodos, isynodos, this Greek word, uh, has its root odos, road. So the very idea of synodos has to do with roads. Uh, therefore, synodos, e synodos, literally means a gathering of those who together hit the same road. In ancient Greek, such people were called with the same word synodos, but in masculine uh, genus with the article o synodos. So there were two Greek words, e synodos and o synodos. So e synodos was the gathering, o synodos was the one who attended a gathering. Hmm? Synodos. Synodos. Well, not quite so, because I checked it in the, in the, in the dictionary, in the Brill dictionary, and it stated it's also o synodos. Not just, in the modern, it is synodos, but in the ancient Greek, it was o synodos. You may check it out as well. Well, no? Okay, we can discuss it. <laughs> Of course, the church did not coin this word, but reused it from the ancient Greek vocabulary. Hence is my third hypothesis. Christian synodality absorbed some semantic elements attached to the word synodos in its classical usage. Such reutilization and repurposing of the ancient notion are similar to what happened to the word ecclesia. The latter was also borrowed by the Christian church from the political language of ancient Greece. Of course, there was this translation of Septuagint where Kahal Yahweh was, was translated as, uh, uh, as uh, Ecclesia to Theu. Uh, but uh, for the ancient Christians, I'm quite sure uh, they had in front of them the ancient Ecclesia, just the one that we saw today when they decided to call their gatherings as Ecclesia. Um, so in ancient Greece, as we all know, Ecclesia meant regular gatherings of some urban strata and expressed the quintessence of the democratic system of uh, political decision-making. The church borrowed this notion in order, among other things, to emphasize its preferable way of decision-making through conciliar gatherings. 
From this perspective, it could be called itself synodos instead of ecclesia. Mm. So I would argue that both terms, synodos and ecclesia, in their very ancient meanings are applicable to what we now call ecclesia. The original ecclesia was not just an event, but also a place, as we just said so today. Sometimes ecclesia were designated and designed specifically for such meetings, like Athens' Pnyx. Sometimes theaters and other uh, spacious venues were used for ecclesial gatherings. Uh, like this one, which I saw in Italy, in Pestum, what is used to be Posidonia. Uh, this is a beautiful ecclesia, almost a Baroque style in Italy, as it should be. And uh, another one is this one. Probably you even recognize some people on this page, on this uh, picture. So this is another ecclesia. The idea of synodos, like the idea of ecclesia, comprises both the event and space. It originally meant and continues meaning a gathering. Aristophanes, in his uh, Thesmophoriasuse, referred to the meetings of the Athenians by two synonymous words, ecclesia and synodos. So for Aristoph Aristophanes, uh, they were two synonyms, ecclesia and synodos. I quote Aristophanes. Uh, pray that all may happen for the best at this, at this gathering, both for the greatest advantage of Athens. Well, once we are in Greece, uh, let me quote it in Greek. Ephheste ecclesia tin de ke synodon, tin nin kalista ke arista piise, poliophelosmen ti poli ti Athenaeon. So he puts together ecclesia tin de ke synodon. Even more explicit about this is Aristotle, who puts the word uh, synodos in line with vuli and ecclesia. So Aristotle also uses in the same line, ecclesia, vuli, and synodos. Excuse me. The root uh, of the word synodos, iodos, implies a place. A road itself is a place. And such a place, let me show you. Oh, no, it's not this one. Okay, uh, uh, a road itself is a place. It also leads to a place which is important for those who take the road. In ancient Greece, some of such roads led to ecclesia, like uh, the road um, leading to Pnyx in Athens. And I believe our next... This one, it's a road to Pnyx. Uh, in Athens. So uh, they were connected physically. I mean, Ecclesia in Pnyx, for example, it had uh, a road leading to it. And those uh, uh, that road was had some kind of relation, I believe, even though it is speculative to, uh, to Ecclesia. Um, Even, uh, even more intrinsically, the notions of ecclesia and synodos became connected in the Christian era. Hans Küng insightfully explored this in interconnectedness in his treatise, The Structures of the Church. Um, we have come here for the same, uh, uh, we have come here to this place, to this uh, colloque uh, for the same purpose, to explore this interconnectedness. It is worth exploring some nuances in the ancient usage of the word synodos. And it is amazing how they have become refle reflected in the Christian notions of synodality. I will dwell on these nuances in the remaining part of my presentation. Let me start with the earliest recorded instance of the word synodos in the Greek language. It goes back to the period when the democratic institutions in Athens, including ecclesia, were in the process of initial formation. Solon, in the 6th century BC, according to a surviving fragment, referred with some disappointment to sinners that serve injustice. I quote Solon, Eghar desmeneon tacheos poli iraton asti trihete en synodis, tis adikeosi philos. Tavtamen en dimosi strefete kaka. So he refers to, to a synod, Solon, with a negative kind of attitude in mind. Aesop, in the same period of time, also referred to synods rather sarcastically. For example, in his fable 83, 
the fox and the monkey, he spoke about a synod of illogical animals, literally a synod, a synod of illogical animals. I'd like to quote this fable completely. It's really funny and it's here. Yeah. A monkey once danced in, in an, an assembly of the beasts. Assembly here is synodos. And so pleased them all by his performance that they elected him their king. Well, almost a bishop. A fox, envying him in the, uh, him the honor, discovered a piece of meat lying in a trap and leading the monkey to the place where it was, said that she had found a store but had not used it, but had kept it for him as treasure trove of the uh, kingdom, of his kingdom, and counseled him to lay hold on, of it. The monkey approached carelessly and was caught in the trap. And on his accus accusing the fox of purposely uh, leading him into the snare, she replied, oh monkey, and are you with such a mind as yours going to be king over the beasts? So that is the parable of Aesop. For the assembly of beasts, Aesop used, used the word synodos and synodoton alohon zon. Uh, so essentially, um, it has the same negative connotation as for Solon, this, this word synodos per se. So synodos first was a bad word in the Greek uh, kind of uh, archaic tradition. It is also noteworthy that for elected uh, him their king, the original has Vasilevs i Pavton e Hirotonithi. So uh, literally, the monkey was Hirotonized consecrated to become uh, a king in the synod. So it's a very church language, which was used by as a, well, it's a coincidence, of course, but it's a very funny coincidence, I find it. Uh, so essentially this fable explains maybe, speaking sarcastically, what is going in some church councils. Uh, only later, <laughs> On, only later, the word synodus was endorsed with more positive connotations. For example, Herodotus used this word in constructing the concept of Greek civilization as opposite to the Persian barbarianism. In the book nine of his history, he counterposed the ordered way in which the Greek army was grouped, a linon, a linon synodon, to a rather chaotic crowd of the barbarians, barbar barbarophonon ihin. So synodos as the opposite to e uh, to the crowd. Another Greek historian of the Persian campaigns, Xenophon, well, we, we were um, explained today about, uh, today about the Persian campaigns, so it's very appropriate to mention them again. So Xenophon concurred with Herodotus's words use, uh, word, uh, word usage by applying the term synods to the Greek units fighting the per Persians. A famous Persian general, uh, Tisafernes, according to Xenophon, encountered, su encountered such a synod at the Ephrates River and had to retreat. So Xenophon uh, writes, Ogar Tisafernes antiproti synodo uk effige. In other words, the Greek historians underpin the word synodos with the subtext of order as opposite to house. They used it in the pol polemical context. Christian synods were gathered in a similar context with the same purpose, to bring order to the church matters and to fight for uh, that order and truth, almost like the Greeks fought against the Persians. Plato liked the word synodos and used it together with, the, with derivatives of over 10 times. It, he was really a heavy user of the term synodos and the derivatives. For him, it meant primarily random encounters between people, usually friends, but could also apply to larger meetings. Some of such meetings could be religious and indeed for offering sacrifices. And let me... Uh, jump to Plato. He describes in, in his uh, laws, we shall employ these subdivisions and give to each portion the name of a god or of a child of gods and bestow on it altars and all that belongs uh, thereto. And at these we shall appoint two assemblies, synodos, he uses the word synodos, every month for sacrifice of which 12 yearly shall be for the whole tribal division and 12 for its urban section only. The object of this shall be first to offer thanksgiving to the gods and their attendants, and secondly, to promote fellowship amongst ourselves 
and the mutual uh, acquaintance we spoke of, an asso association of every sort. I believe this is an important statement, which identifies two main tasks that participants in ancient synods were supposed to fulfill, offering something to gods and socializing with one another. These tasks correspond to two basic aspects of synodality in Christianity, theological and social. Well, synods are not just about uh, theology, they are also about meeting other people, about social, uh, socialization. These uh, church representatives come together to councils to praise God, give solutions to the pressing issues, and to enjoy each one's company. And it goes, this idea goes back to Plato. The term synodos was even more popular with Aristotle, who used it almost twice more than uh, Plato. His usage was similar to that of Plato. Thus, Aristotle emphasized both the religious and social aspects of synods. The latter, for Aristotle, featured a degree of entertainment. He describes uh, is um, uh, he describes in um, his Ethica Nicomachia. Some associate, associations, you can read it on the screen as well. Some associations appear to be formed for the sake of pleasure. For example, religious guilds and dining clubs, which are unions for sacrifice and social intercourse. But all these associations seem to be subordinate to the association of the state, which aims not at a, temporarily, a temporary advantage, but at one covering the whole of life. Those who gather in such meetings, peritafta synodus, here, here he uses, the word synodos, combine to perform sacrifices and hold festivals in connection with them, thereby, uh, thereby both paying honor to the gods and providing pleasant, ho pleasant holidays for themselves. As, a have, as if having Aristotle's advice in mind, those who organized what we now know as the first ecumenical council by the beautiful lake of Nicaea, now is Nigelu, even in our days, it is a recreational zone where one can enjoy swimming in shallow and clean water surrounded by fresh green. It's almost as pleasant as it is here in Kalamata, the water of the Lake of Nicaea. And I am sure that bishops who gathered there in 325 enjoy the environment and themselves, as everyone participating in, in the synodal events should do, as we do now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Father Cyril, for your presentation, uh, giving us an idea of the term, the concept of synodus in a long uh, um, explanation through the centuries and uh, cultural backgrounds. Uh, may I ask, I uh, invite you to um, uh, ask questions or um, make remarks as you like. Yeah. Mm, I have a question. I don't know if I'm able to formulate it properly, but I hope you'll understand what I mean. I would like to know when, maybe you know, um, the concept of uh, uh, ecumenical council appeared. I mean, when the church um, became conscious that there are different kind of councils that are more important than the others, because when we um, when we see the history of the of the councils after Nicaea, uh, it was not the point of reference for other councils. There were councils in Antioch, um, yeah. more important and uh, more important creeds. So um, when when that idea started to to be more um, concrete, uh, yeah. visible. 
Thank you for this question. Well, uh, my guesswork is that maybe, uh, you know, uh, and you may correct me, but my guesswork is that the moment they tried to replicate Nicaea was that moment of, uh, you know, rising self-awareness of the, of, of the need for such an ecumenical council, especially the Council of Nicaea that you mentioned. I think that was the probably the first one of the earliest attempts because it was an attempt to replicate Nicaea, essentially to, to repeat Nicaea in a better way. Uh, then uh, and then the, all the, the uh, following attempts, including the Council in Rimini, in Niki, and others, uh, when they tried to um, uh, actually every emperor in the in every decade that followed Nicaea tried to have something like Nicaea. Uh, that was clearly an indication that they uh, Nicaea grew big in their consciousness. Probably it was not as big in the consciousness of the participants. participants in Nicaea. Uh, they did not perceive Nicaea as big as it would become perceived, you know, later on. But certainly in these later uh, attempts of uh, a replication of, of Nicaea, uh, the, most of them were Aryan, we would call them Aryan, even though it's uh, incorrect. Uh, this idea of uh, an ecumenical council, or like a, a council which is um, important for the entire empire uh, uh, would emerge. That would be my guess. Yeah. Andrew. There is actually a quite well-known article by Henry Chadwick on the, the origins of the meaning of ecumenicos e e applied to a synod. And if I can remember it rightly, but I probably missed most of it, forgotten most of it. It's it's it's, it's nice here is first called an ecumenical synod sometime in the middle of the fourth century. Um and the, and, and by about the fifth century, many ecumenical councils begin to call themselves ecumenical councils as they meet. Certainly it's true of the second ecumenical council of Nicaea, which uh, calls itself an ecumenical council in order to contradict the claim of the council of, um, of, uh, of the, the, the um, iconoclast council of, of um, Iria. Iria, Iria, that's right, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, Henry, um, Henry Chadwick, Re reflects on what the meaning really was. And one he makes the suggestion, but I can't remember this is his, his final suggestion or early suggestion that calling the council, we're calling a council ecumenicals meant that the bishops were able to claim their travel expenses from the state. Yeah. That's exactly my point that uh, it changed the game, this uh, accessibility of roads. Um, may I? Just add to the question of the ecumenical councils. Of course, uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, the official name was the Great and Holy Council. This you find in the in the texts, and therefore that was also the reason that the, the synod, the council in Crete, was took up mm -hmm. the same wording. It was unfortunately I don't have uh, the the texts uh, now here, the exact uh, text, but it was in the middle of the fourth century that it first came uh, up to speak of an ecumenical council. But it took some time as till it got it, this specific definite uh, uh, notion as we use it today. Other remarks or questions? I just want to say that to add to this that exactly those uh, starting with the Council of Antioch and the, the councils that fall like in Rimini and Nikia, as I said, that is exactly the middle of the fourth century when they started conceiving the idea of, of the ecumenical council by trying to overcome, to override Nicaea quite paradoxically. So this might just uh, hint to the fact that things even developed mm -hmm. and were not at the very beginning already clear as we would think today. <laughs> okay, other remarks or questions? Michelle? <coughs> Je m'exprime en français. Merci pour uh, cette uh, excellente présentation. Euh, une remarque et, et une question. Une remarque, c'est que, à mon avis, il faut bien distinguer entre deux types de conciles. Les conciles proprement institutionnels, à partir 
du Concile de Nicée qui fixe qu'il faut se réunir régulièrement, au moins deux fois par an en principe. Donc à partir de là, il y a des conciles qu'on peut qualifier d'institutionnels. En français d'ailleurs, on distingue le mot « synode » et « concile mmh. ». Quand c'est institutionnel, on dit plutôt « synode ». Et puis à côté, il y a des conciles extraordinaires mmh. et qui à mon avis ne sont pas des institutions, sont plutôt des événements. Des conciles que j'appellerais de généraux. Pourquoi je n'appelle pas écuménique Parce qu'au moment où on les réunit, on ne sait pas s'ils seront écuméniques. Il y a des conciles généraux qui ont échoué. Ça, c'est pour la remarque. Maintenant, la question, parce que vous avez commencé le propos en disant le concile fondamental, le concile premier, c'est le concile de Jérusalem. Mmh. Ma question est la suivante. Est-ce que c'est vraiment un concile mmh. Est-ce que ce n'est pas un mythe, yeah. en fait Well, my brief answer is, I don't know whether it is really, uh, it, is pro, it looks like an extrapolation of the idea of later councils upon Jerusalem, right? It's like the extrapolation of, uh, of posterior ideas about conciliarity upon the first century. Uh, well, uh, I don't know, probably it's not really appropriate to call that, that gathering as a uh, council. C certainly the word synodos is not applicable to that one uh, because the word synodos was not yet used to, to describe those gatherings. So it's, my, it's a much later uh, term. Um, actually, uh, yes, um, I think uh, only when, uh, well, when, when this term started to be used, we could speak about the councils properly, synods at least. Well, uh, well that's, that would be my answer. I would doubt probably that it's, uh, it's really a synodos, just only, also only because, uh, because it was not called and did not call itself a synodos, among other things. If I may uh, remark also, may I? give a remark also. Um, the big, in my view, the big uh, scholar in, in, in research on councils is Hermann Josef Sieben, who has written many books. And I talked with him and he said, it is amazing that the council uh, of the apostles, uh, of the acts of the apostles was never referred to as a model in later mm -hmm. history of, uh, of councils. They were not referring to it. And he, went, yeah, he was thinking, what can we do about this fact? Okay. Si, il y a tout de même une référence qui est faite au concile de Jérusalem, c'est la formule. Toi, hi au pnevma, qui est évoxé, hi min, qui est toi, hi au pnevma, ti. La formule yeah. est importante, symbolique. Yeah. Implicitement. Oui. oui. Thank you. Uh, other remarks or questions? If not, I'm happy that at least at the very last moment we have also a paper on, on synodality as Father Demetrius yesterday Uh, uh, claimed that the, such a paper is missing. <laughs> uh, so, He had to stay a bit later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so far, I thank you very much for the serial for your paper, and then we can I give the word to Franz Mali. So for this uh, for this final discussion, which is uh, on our schedule, I would like to inform you that we have planned, as it is also foreseen for the for the other meetings, to publish all the contributions, a few photos. If uh, Theresia and uh, Thomas will send us their photos, and. Um, We propose that you send, if it is possible, your your contributions till uh, the end of the year. And we hope that 
you receive in response to your contribution the old um, say um, uh, volume of the last meeting because we did not finish yet the, the redaction the most of the contributions are, are ready and, and prepared but we are um, in contact with the edition and one or two uh, contributions are still missing and the index and so on but uh, it's in the final uh, elaboration and um, so this is one information that i want to to and to send it to Teresa, to me, maybe also to Alexei, uh, and we will uh, make a reduction of the contributions. Um, first of all, this. Secondly, um, I want to thank especially Teresa for all the organization for the preparing uh, and uh, of this meeting, and especially here, but he is not here, Father Alexios. Ah, ah Father Alexios. Um, for all the very sympathic and and friendly um, uh, reception here in this house for all the preparation for all the small and big uh, uh, things you had to prepare and to uh, organize every day for us um, so a very very uh, big thanks to you and and to his met to the his excellency the Metropoli metropolitan for having uh, accepted us here in Kalamata it's certainly and uh, what I want to say is or ask you if you have some general uh, reflections or feedbacks to our meeting now or to the to the place I think uh, uh, you can add maybe some some words also to Father Alexios and uh, to the metropolitan his excellency um, and uh, his eminence okay his eminence um or wh whatever you want to express for the next uh, organization and for the next meeting we have decided yesterday that we will we that we are invited to olomots uh, next time in two years and uh, if you have some other remarks uh, they are welcome she remembers me that i should say that till the end of this year you are invited to send the final version of your paper so okay any remarks, any greetings, any, I don't know. I think that the topic of synodality is rather important, especially in the in the Catholic Church. And as we have seen, it's a remark of, of my part that um, synodality is more practiced in, in the East or in the Eastern churches than in the Western church, I have the impression. And uh, thanks to Pope Francis, I have the impression that this, how to say, this uh, renewal of synodality uh, has increased in, in within the Catholic Church. And uh, I hope that it will go on in this way and um, develop further. Yeah, there is a... Concerning thanks, I would, of course, very much thank uh, Father Alexios, but also Father Philippos. I will um, yeah, write him also because he did all the preparation and that was in a very nice way and very efficient. <laughs> so I will also thank him very much. And uh, Father Alexis, Alexios made um, perfectly took over and uh, with his presence made us uh, our stay simply marvelous and did everything what we need immediately and with great care.
We have prepared a small present for Father Alexios and uh, Father Philippos also. And I invite all the participants here in the room to sign the small uh, greeting, which was formulated by Theresia in behavior of this book, before we can uh, deliver it to, to Father Alexios with all the names and the signatures of everybody of us. If you agree with that, I invite you to come here and to sign yeah. okay. the paper. <laughs> And then we will give it to Father Alexis and okay. Philippe. Okay. okay. Is there some other question or in the, the sense of organization or whatsoever? Yeah. I may remind us that this evening we have a dinner uh, with the mayor of Kalamata. Uh, I'm very grateful that uh, he will show us um, and uh, his uh, uh, respect and and, and uh, his um, generosity. generosity. So, but uh, please come at eight fifteen. Eight fifteen. Oh. Ah no! Oh, excuse me. This I under. Please go. Sorry. One question. Yes. For the dinner will be at eight o'clock, but, but we will meet at the reception at which time? Uh, 7.45. Okay. Okay. Eh? okay. Okay, we will meet at 7.45 at the reception this evening. Yes. This yeah, evening. This evening. Tomorrow okay. morning, we have to be at the reception. At... Yes. Tomorrow morning, we have to be at the reception at 8.15. And... Uh, for the evening, we have uh, in the Church of St. John Baptist, yeah. uh, the, uh, Catholic, the Mass. Catholic Mass. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, at evening. But in the morning is uh, the Orthodox liturgy, Byzantine liturgy in the cathedral. Yes. In the cathedral. yes, and I have, we have uh, after that um, uh, uh, right. A breakfast and then we can visit several churches and there's a nice program prepared already also by father Philippus and father uh, alexios yeah. in um in charge of the of his eminences the metropolitan okay any other question if there are not i and Alex said we will leave already tomorrow, rather early in the morning. And so I wish you all the best for the final day tomorrow for the liturgy, for the for a very beautiful uh, celebration, and uh, for the visit in the in the town of Kalamata. Um, I have to go back because on Monday morning usual work is beginning at eight o'clock in the morning. Okay. Then I would like to thank uh, Franz Mali very much for all his efforts and work, especially also in the in the publication and uh, all uh, support and everything you do for this for this patristic colloquy. Is already from the very beginning we are here. As I said, we are now only um, five or six persons left, but Franz Mali was always there. And thank you very much for all you did. Il faut, remercier, il faut remercier aussi à Alexei parce que c'est lui this qui organise pratiquement. This I wanted to add. I thank very much Alexei for his great work in the publication uh, as yeah, organizing the, the stuff and doing the correction and all these things very well. Gregor Emenecker could not come this time. He is also for the whole um, style and the, uh, the other work uh, is responsible for that. But especially at, at this occasion, since Alexei is here, I want to express my cordial thanks. So I invite you everybody to accept Alexios evidently to sign the paper here and then we can deliver the book to for that exercise. There's, prob there's probably also uh, coffee breaks uh, prepared. So. See you later. <laughs>